Well, good morning, church family. It's so good to be in worship with you today. Let me give you a few nuggets before we jump right into Genesis chapter two. If you have a Bible, I wanna go ahead and invite you to flip to Genesis two. We're gonna be in verses 18 through 25 this morning. Um, but I wanna let you know Shepherd Blood Center, a great partner locally, is out at the back kind of corner over by the fire station of our campus today. We just wanted you to know that they are here, they're available. If you are at a place where you could give blood, they're a great partner in our community. And they say that it just one time giving blood can save up to three lives. And so how cool that we could sacrifice a few moments um, to give blood and it could literally, physically change people's lives. And so we love Shepherd, we love what they're doing. Um, also wanted to let, let you know, men in particular, um, that this coming Tuesday, for every Tuesday for the month of May, uh, we're gonna be meeting in our student building from six to 7 a.m. Um, nothing fancy, no breakfast. We're just gonna humble ourselves as men and pray together. And we just believe that as we pray together um, that God's gonna change our relationships, he's gonna change our families as we just pursue and we seek him together. So we've been in this series called It's All in the Family. Are you having fun yet? Right, we've dealt with some pretty serious topics. We started the first week talking about what does it mean to be human? Like what is humanity? We are the Imago Dei, we're made in the image of God and what does it mean to walk in that identity and that distinctness and what does that mean for dignity of every single human life from birth to death and, and everything in between? And then last week we dealt with a very tough kind of conversation in our culture, really going after what does it mean to have a gender, to, to be given a specific identity by God, and how do these genders, two genders, male and female, work together. And so if you haven't been with us, know that we're in this process in these first three weeks of laying a foundation with some very deep roots, and as we lay those foundations, then we're gonna add eight elements of what does it mean to have healthy families. Like next week we're gonna talk about love, we're gonna be talking about submission, we're gonna be talking about truthfulness, we're gonna be talking about all of these elements, but before we can get there in the practicality of that, that we have to first lay this foundation. And so the third kind of foundation I wanna lead and leave today, and I wanna ask the question is, does marriage matter? Does marriage matter? Well, it's getting hotter outside, and with heat comes growth. And so many of you, like me, are having to weed uh, pine straw beds and whatnot, and you're having to cut back uh, different br branches and limbs and shrubs and cut your grass. And um, I, I brought a little illustration for you today um, because I've had to cut out um, these little boogers right here out of many of my beds. These things, by the way, are a result of Genesis 3 in the fall, in the curse, right? Does anybody know what this is, what this is called? What is it called? Cab wire? Cat briar? If that ain't a redneck saying for it, I don't know what is. <laughs> I've heard it uh, called, um, where is it? It's in my notes. Smilax? Smilax? Anybody? Okay. Maybe Greenbrier? Is that right, Brock? You don't know, man. You're supposed to know these things, right? <laughs> don't you have a degree in this thing, man? So um, I don't know what it is, but it's awful and it's from the devil. But here's what I want you to know about this stuff. If you go in your bed, sometimes six feet tall, eight feet tall, very thin, but very resilient. And what, what I want you to know about these is if you spray herbicide, the strongest kind you got on this, you know what it does? Absolutely nothing. Good answer, right? And if you give your five-year-old an ax like I did Thursday, and my wife freaked out, right? But no other kids were around, so I said, he's alone. He, the worst he can do is hurt himself, right? So he's axing, and you know what happens when you ax these from the top? Three weeks later, it grows back. Why? It's because the root system is crazy on these things, right? And so it's like potatoes, and this is actually a small one. This isn't a big one. And um, they actually grow sometimes like in, in like rows. So it'll actually be like you start to dig one of these, and there'll be a row like five, six feet long of these things with different ones shooting up. And so the reason that whatever you call this, cat briar or whatever, um, can, can hold in winds and rains and herbicide, and because it is resilience, resilient, has everything to do with its roots. 
And so I wanna show you that today because you may be asking the question, like Stephen, why are we talking about these deep questions? Like why, why aren't we keeping it kind of, kind of easy believism? Why aren't we just, just talking to the next generation on a shelf or a level that they'll understand? And I would tell you it's because I don't wanna form baby Christians at this church. I would tell you that I wanna disciple us in such a way that our roots are deep and we are firmly planted on the rock of God's word and God's truth in such a way that whatever wave of ideologies of our day, they will not shake us because we are rooted and we are grounded people. So I wanna ask and answer the question today, what does the Bible say about marriage? Don't throw that up quite yet um, because I jumped ahead in my notes. And so um, I, next thing I want you to, to understand today is that um, weddings are pretty awesome. I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, there's actually been a boom in weddings. In 2022 was the most amount of weddings in the United States since 1984. 2.5 million weddings happened in 2022. You know what the average cost nationally of those weddings were? 10 grand, keep going. Not, not quite 40, $29,000. You know what I did when I read that number? Thank you, Lord, I got five boys, right? <laughs> but I was also talking with somebody in Discover Warren. We had about 25 people over there with our new member class and checking things out. And Drew Robinson is over here. He's our connections and communications pastor from Augusta campus. So grateful you and your family are here. And he was leading through that class, but I was talking to her. She had two girls and uh, we were laughing because I was telling her about the statistic. And then I paused for a minute and I said, but trust me, my grocery bill for 18 years is definitely more than $29,000 of difference between these boys and these girls. But, but weddings are awesome, right? I love officiating weddings. It's an honor to get chosen and to get asked to do that for couples. And I'm at the front of the church and they're coming down and the, you open the door, the bride comes and there's all these dynamics with the family, some good, some bad. Um, but ultimately it's a, it's a moment of joy. It's a moment of celebration. And you go to the reception, you hang out and you get, give gifts and you, you drink and you eat and you do all these sort of things. And it, it's an amazing time. But the hardest reality of a pastor is that when I stand down front, I know when that bride walks in and she meets that groom, that about three out of 10 of them won't make it. Some statistics would tell you five out of 10 of them won't make it. Um, I would, if you do a little bit of research, a little dig a little deeper in the church, it's probably more like 30%. But even at 30%, that's just a moment and a statistic that I now see, and I've done this long enough, actually play itself out in the life of believers and in the life of marriages that began with such flustering joy that ended in great brokenness. And so I wanna just pause for a moment like I did last week, and I wanna read you my notes because I wrote this with great intentionality, because I wanna humbly and intentionally let you know from a pastor's heart where I'm at and how I wanna approach this today. You see, I realize as I speak on a topic like marriage, I'm speaking not to a topic, but I'm speaking to people. And I know when I say the word marriage, for some of you in the room, it's marked by brokenness and divorce and betrayal and et cetera in your background and it's a part of your story. And I want you to know today, I don't want anything I'm going to say to cause any undue guilt or shame or bitterness in your mind or in your heart. But on the same wavelength, I wanna be a pastor who preaches with great compassion and clear, uh, compassion and care, but also great clarity from God's word as we need to know what does the Bible tell us about marriages. I think one of the reasons our marriages and our families are struggling today is because we're so easily indwelling and believing lies of our culture. John Mark Comer in his book, Live No Lies, he's also re written Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, two of my probably top five books. We use Live No Lies when we preached our 2 Corinthians series. And in that book, he said this, I think we can all agree our world is not thriving. The strife, unrest, distrust, confusion, chaos, corruption, all point to the same realization. There is a myth of progress. Just because we live longer, know more, and have much does not mean we live better or live well. C.S. Lewis would have called this chronological snobbery, thinking that 
somehow because we're smarter and we're more advanced than our parents or our grandparents, that we somehow are living better lives. Because as we look at the culture around us, I think we all see with the hookup culture, with por pornography, eroding intimacy, with gender dysphoria I spoke about last week, and ultimately divorce and the percentages and the numbers. I think we can all, as we hear these things, kind of agree and sit back and say, yes, we really got it right in our culture right now. We're better off than we've ever been, right? That's not what we would do. The reality is, is that we're not better off than we've ever been. Been. And so the question is, what do we do about it? So I think we need a realignment. And when you get a realignment on your car, um, it's out of alignment, so you need to shift something. You need to change something. We need, we need something to measure it by in order that we can get on the path that God intended for us. And I think that's gonna be God's word for us. Let me speak to one other group in the room really quick, and then we're gonna jump into Genesis chapter two. Um, if you're hearing my voice today, you may be single, right? You may be single for a season, or you may be called to be single. But I want you to know today, this is for you as well. You convictionally, persuasion of according to God's word, need to know where you stand on this because we're a church family, right? And in a church family, it's made up of all different parts and functions. And because we're a family and we're in this together, that means our marriages matter, that means our parenting matters, that means our singleness matters. And I'm gonna be speaking to all of those kind of realms of where we find ourselves in life and in ministry and in our homes each given week as we talk about these elements together. All right, you ready? Wow, two of you, okay, great. <laughs> so here we go. What does the Bible say about marriage? Number one, if you're taking notes, right on the top of your page, what does the Bible say about marriage? Number one, marriage was designed and established by God. Marriage was designed and established by God. In Genesis chapter two, verses 18 through 24, it says this, then the Lord God said, it is, what's he say? Not good, right? It's the first time he said that, not good, that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he could call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to, come, to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs out, and he closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man, and the man said, this, at last, is my bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. And then it goes on at 24 and 25 to really give the um, kind of intentionality in marriage, and this is what it says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked, sorry, I said that like a redneck, both naked and were not ashamed. All right, so what we have here is God creating and establishing and ordaining what marriage would be and how it should look. From the outset, marriage is gender specific. It's a male with a female for life. And because God created and designed marriage, our world cannot redefine marriage. Regardless of what our laws say and what states say, what politicians say, marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman for life. You see, what happens here? What happens here in Genesis two is we find Adam, right? He's been created. He's naming all of the created beings and things. And after all of this, God looks at him and he says, this is not good. That word carries with it, like it, it's, it's not there yet. It's not complete. God isn't finished. He's still got something to do in creation to bring forth the fulfillment of fulfilling his purpose for them in order that they could fill the God-given purpose in obedience to what he had commanded them as well. And so God in his provision and his care for Adam says, hey, you need a helper. And when I say that term, ladies, for way too long, too many people have used that term in a derogatory, demeaning way to women as if they are the help or the administrative assistant, a position of subservience to a man. That is not what it's talking about when it says a helper. 
this term that it's talking about, let me just let you into a little secret, is also used the same term in Psalm 121 as it re, in regards to how God is our helper. The, the kind of Greek term for that is used in Hebrews 13, 6, when it says God is our helper. And let me tell you right now, God is not subservient to you. We are subservient to him. And so this word in the Hebrew for helper, what it actually connotates is like a military support or a reinforcement to ensure that a battle is not lost. And so this helper isn't to be the weaker object, but it, it is supposed to be a subject of strength and stability and completeness for the man. It also uses the word suitable. I think in, in the ESV version, it uses the word fit for him. The implications here is that they were incomplete in and of themselves but they were complete when they were brought together as if two puzzle pieces coming together to make this beautiful picture that is on the puzzle. And in the same way, one gender alone or one gender with another gender cannot in and of themselves fulfill the God-given divine mandate to be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion on the earth. That can only be done, and that can only be had bi biologically from one man and one woman in a covenant marital relationship with one another. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, writing from a Nazi prison to his niece getting married, said this, marriage is more than your love for each other. It, is, it has a higher dignity and power, for it is God's holy ordinance through which he wills to perpetuate the human race till the end of time. In your love, you see only two selves in the world, but in marriage, you are a link in the chain of generations, which God calls us to come and to pass away to his glory and calls into his kingdom. In your love, you see only the heaven of your own happiness, but in marriage, you are placed at a post of responsibility towards the world and mankind. Your love is your own private possession, but marriage is more than something personal. It is a status, it is an office. And so as I say, marriage is designed and established by God, what I mean by that is that we will not have a healthy, fulfilling, satisfying marriage without God's intervention which should cause us from this first point, our posture towards this thing called marriage should be one of great humility and desperation for God's spirit to give us help. And we cannot do this alone. I'm so thankful for so many of you that were at our parenting night this Wednesday night. And I'm even more thankful for so many of you who went and held my babies as they were screaming and crying and way past our bedtime from 6 to 8 p.m. in order that young, over 100 young families could get poured into and sharpened in their parenting. And just like I said there when I started that session, I quoted Psalm 127, which says, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. And with the, the point I was getting at is we can have great intentionality, great effort, and great work. But unless the spirit intervenes in the heart of our children, we are hopeless. And if that's a truth that we realize and that we hold to, what that should cause us in us is a humility and a desperation to go to God and pray for our children. And so we will never operate in marriage as we intended unless God alone is central and intervenes. So marriage is created and established by God. Number two, marriage is a sacred covenant, not a social construct, or I would even say a social contract. Marriage is, not, is a sacred covenant, not a social contract. Notice what it said again in 24 and 25. We actually have the reference on the screen you're gonna see wrong. That's actually 24 and 25. I typed it wrong in that slide. It says, therefore man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. That's a steadfastness, that's a keeping together is what that term means, to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Intimacy, right? And the man and the wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. These terms, hold fast and one flesh, they, rep they represent an indissolvable, in this. Yeah, indissolvable bond. It's, it's this bond that cannot be broken. It's a, it's a covenant. So let me, let me just pause for a minute and kind of step back from this. 
what is, it, what is the difference in a covenant and in a contract? Because a marriage isn't a contract, though we want to make it that in our culture. It's a covenant before God. And so a covenant, I would define it this way, is a lifelong partnership made before God resulting in a lifetime of caring for one another. It is not a vow made, like we don't say this at the front of the church when I'm marrying someone, as long as they both shall love. What I say is as long as they both shall live, right? Why do I say that? I say that because you're committing, you're covenanting together to marriage for a lifetime until one of you dies. And if one of you dies, the other ones are released from that covenant and they can go and they can remarry. Where do I find that? Romans chapter seven, verses two and three says this. For a married woman is bound to her, to, by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Okay, so what is the difference then in a lifelong covenant and a contract? Well, I would say a contract comes with exit clauses and a covenant does not. What I mean by that, if you've been watching the NFL draft, I've been watching that and, and, and tra trades that are going on between people. And I saw one that was talking about Aaron Rodgers going from the, where was he coming from? Green Bay Packers. Hello, Green Bay Packers. Um, somebody, somebody said that too passionately, like you really love Green Bay. Uh, Green Bay Packers. We're Atlanta Falcons fans, and it is just so difficult, y'all. So Green Bay Packers, and he's getting traded to the New York Jets, right? And in that, in that contract, what it says is like how much they're gonna pay for him, what that's gonna entail, the other players that are being traded. And then it had a, an exit kind of clause that, 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 New, that Green Bay is actually gonna get the second round pick next year in 2024 from the New York Jets as long as Aaron Rodgers plays in at least 60% of the snaps for the New York Jets. So guess what, if he doesn't play in 60% of the snaps, what happens, right? They're out, right? They don't have to do it. They don't, they don't get what they thought they were gonna get. He's gotta play that amount or it's kind of out. It's, it's a caveat to the contract. It's an escape clause. Well, I would tell you that marriages before God don't come with escape clauses. They're a covenant to the other person and in your marriage and a commitment and a persuasion for life. And as I say that, many of you are thinking, well, doesn't the Bible give some liberty for divorces for certain reasons, Stephen? And my answer to you, very slowly, very particularly, and very humbly, is yes. But at the same time, in a, in a room this size, what I don't wanna do is give you escape clauses in order that you can justify means of escape. What I wanna do is commend you and persuade you that God's desire is always redemption and reconciliation and remaking and refashioning for his glory and for your good. And as I've counseled multiple couples in my office, I've never counseled one where I thought escape or divorce was the best case scenario. In almost every single case, it's always a counsel. And sometimes they took long work Sometimes there's been serious betrayal. Sometimes there's been lack of trust. But always, 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 I wanna give them the glimmer of light and hope for a future for their marriage. And so Jesus talks about this in Matthew 19, verses three through nine. And I just wanna read it just so you get a little vision of how God views marriage. Ooh, that is not where I meant to be. We'll go Ephesians in a little bit. Let me flip back. Matthew 19, you notice I did not win the Bible drills growing up. <laughs> In Matthew 19, verses three through six, you see this interaction with the Pharisees. The Pharisees came up to him and they tested him. They asked him, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So they had made it, so they diminished marriage so much to the point where they could get divorced for any reason at all. And he answered, have you not read, and he's gonna reference back to Genesis 2, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and he said to them, and he quotes it, therefore man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but they are one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And then they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And notice this, 
very close to God's heart, notice what he says. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So is there biblical precedent and means for divorce? Yes. But what God has joined together, he doesn't desire for any man, including husband or wife, to separate. And just think about this from a second, for, for a second, from God's point of view of his covenant commitment to us. You see, when you become a believer, and you repent of your sin and you put your life and your trust and your hope in Jesus, it says that you will become a child of God. And there's not an exit clause for him. I mean, think if he operated that way with us. If she does this or if he does this, then God's gonna step back from his commitment to you. No, at the center of his covenant, covenant to us is mercy and grace and forgiveness. And in the same way, that's gotta be the lens, the lens of the gospel that we view into our marriages when our spouses wrong us or say something too sharp to us or have infidelity or have any of these sort of things. We've gotta first look through the lens of how God views us through Christ. Number three, not only is marriage a sacred covenant, not a social contract, marriage is a blessing for us, but it's not all about us. Ooh, that one hurts, right? Message is a blessing for us, but it's not all about us. Notice what it says again in Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Look at these terms. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Okay, if you're an adult in the room, you know what that means, right? And the man and his wife were both naked and they were unashamed. So what we see here is the consummation of marriage becoming one together. What we see is intimacy and exposure without shame. And I tell my students, when I used to be in student ministry, I was speaking to high schoolers, 14 to 18. Nick, are you bringing sticks up here with you, man? What is that? When I tell them 14 to 18 years old, I did bring sticks up here, that was me. Shame on me. Lord, forgive me for... I don't even know what I was talking about now. <laughs> so when I speak into my, our 14 to 18 year olds' lives is I, I give them a vision for marriage. I say, do you realize that God intends for you what is most joyful, pleasurable, enjoyable, fruitful, and peaceful? They may look at me like, what are you talking about? It's waiting until you are, have a covenant commitment with marriage because it's in that intimacy that you will find your greatest joy and fulfillment in all of these things. It's a blessing to be enjoyed, right? And God has wired and created it that way. But the problem is we always think that we have a better way or a better plan, and we kind of wanna skirt the authority of his, his word, but he has intended. You see, God isn't holding out on you. God knows exactly what is best for you. And what is best is his created and established way called marriage. What I mean by it's a blessing, it is a blessing to be enjoyed. There's companionship, there's intimacy, there's exposure, there's relationship, there's all this fulfillment and love and joy. All of this is good and it is a blessing and it is from God. But also, God intends that your spouse be your greatest tool of sanctification. What I mean about, by that is God cares more about you being holy than he cares about you being happy. Let me say that again. God cares more about you being holy than you being happy. I wasn't the first one to say that. Gary Thomas said it in Sacred Marriage. He said, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? And then John Mark Comer in that same book, Live No Lies, he said this, the sexual liberation, the sexual liberation revolution of the 1960s set in motion a cascade effect, the reversal of the longstanding moral consensus around promiscuity separating sex from marriage worked in tandem with the advent of birth control and the legalization of abortion, separating sex from procreation, which moved on to the legalization of no-fault divorce, turning a covenant into a contract and separated sex from intimacy and fidelity, then to tender and hookup culture, separating sex from romance and turned it into a way to get your needs met which then my fourth point in light of that quote is marriage is about contribution, not compatibility. Marriage is about contribution, not compatibility. 
You may be thinking the Jerry Maguire movie, you complete me, right? Can I just say that's not true? No one person will ever fully satisfy and complete you. It's why Dr. Gary Thomas said this, the problem with looking to another human to complete us is that spiritually speaking, it's idolatry. We're to find our fulfillment and our purpose in God. If we expect our spouse to be God to us, he or she will fail us every day. No person can live up to such expectations. All right, can I get after you men and women for just a minute? I'm gonna pause in the message, I'm gonna talk to men, then I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna talk to women. Let's go to Ephesians chapter five. And I'm not gonna give you all that these verses mean today. We're gonna be preaching these as we talk about some elements of love and submission and all these things in the weeks to come. But I just needed to give you kind of a view and a picture of what I mean by this. Like we're called not to just like take from marriage, we're called to contribute to marriage and to our spouse. And it starts in Ephesians 5 verse 22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Hold on, I, I can't read that and not start with 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Did you hear that? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Notice it didn't say wives submit to men. It said wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Then look at this, husbands, comma, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and, what's it say? Gave. Your call in marriage is not to get, it's to give. And he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, that means like set her apart, make her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies He who loves his wife loves himself. All of that, like I said, we're gonna talk about in way more detail in the weeks to come, but all of that to get you to understand that marriage isn't about you just being compatible in order that you could work well together and your spouse could just give you what you want. You see, marriage isn't about what you can get, it's about what you can give. Marriage is not about what you can seek, it's about how you can serve. Let me say those two things again. Write those in your notes. Those are just separate B points and you didn't have to pay extra for those. Marriage, marriage is not about what you can get. It's about what you can give. Marriage is not about what you can seek. It's about how you can serve. Galatians 6 says this, that that we will reap what we sow. And the question is, what are we sowing into our marriage and into our spouses? I learned this theorem this week, I was looking this up, it's physics theorem, I don't know if I have any kind of, kind of science and physics nerds in the room, but it's called impulse momentum theorem. What it states is that an impulse applied to an object, so if like you have a car and I begin to push it, is equal, so how much you put in is equal to the momentum that will be carried in that. And that's really cool because like it's like pushing it off the, off the deck, seeing how far it goes, how much you push and how hard you push determines how far it will go and with what momentum. But then it says this that I love. It proves that the change in momentum of an object depends not only on the amount of the force applied, but also on the duration that the force is applied. So you may be thinking, Stephen, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about, men, is a lot of us did a big old push when we said I do. And then we left our hands off to let it go. Man, let me just speak to you for just a second. When you're going deer hunting, right? You put up a trail cam, you see an eight point buck, you spray yourself down with deer pee, you go get in a stand for weeks upon weeks just so you can prowl around and hunt to get this one eight point buck, then you're gonna kill him, you're gonna cut his head off, and you're gonna mount him on a wall, and you're gonna go, I got him, right? You trout fishermen, don't laugh at that one, because what you do is you pick the perfect time in the season that you're gonna go up to this this perfect little river, 
then you're gonna stop at a local store or maybe you already did your research ahead of time of what exact bug is biting during that time. And then you actually went, you've never sown a day in your life and all of a sudden you're making this, this little bait that you're gonna throw out there and you're gonna catch these trout and then you catch that trout and you finally do what you're, you're supposed to do. You hold it up, you take a big old picture of it because you gotta show it off and you always say it's way bigger than it's supposed to be. And then, then you're gonna kind of mount that thing up and, and there it is, I caught it, I got it, right? Men, many of you, you saw your wife for the very first time and you want, I want that, right? Your eyes glittered in a certain way because you were attracted to their personality or their looks or whatever it may be. You went and picked them up for their very first date. You spent more money than your budget could account for, right? You opened their door. You did things and said things you probably have never said. You had a nervous kind of butterflies in your stomach but you did everything necessary in this dating period to get to a point that you could catch her, right? And then you got her and she walked down the aisle and you said, I do. And so many of us pushed it forward and then we went, I got it. Don't you see it on the wall? She's amazing. But then we stopped the pursuit. This is not a, a, a dating pursuit, it's a lifelong pursuit of your wife. That's why Psalm 128, I had a brother call me out on this in my own marriage before. And I read the, these verses and just conviction, and I've been doing that a lot in these days. As I preach to you, I first always have to shine a mirror on my own life, own heart, own relationships. And so Psalm 128, it says this, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Let me just stop there. Before I get to anything else about the family, men, your job is to lead be intentional and pursue your wife and love and pursue your kids and raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. You cannot do that without first fearing God and seeking God in his ways and his word. That's why you've got to get up before the rest of your family and meet with God and open his word and say, and Lord Jesus, oh, I need you. Show me how I can be intentional. How can I love my wife? How can I lay myself down for my wife? How can I be intentional with my kids, however many of them there are? It's why we as men are gonna gather this Tuesday and pray from every Tuesday in May from six to 7 a.m. Because I just believe with all of my heart that if the men of this church will humble themselves before God and plead that God would intervene on behalf of their families and their relationships and their kids, that God may just honor and hear our prayers and do something pretty extraordinary in our midst. Men, we're called to steward, shape, and care for our wives' hearts. It says this in that same Psalm, it goes on, it says, you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. Do you know what labor means? What does labor mean? Work. God has made you men to be tired. Just hear me, I, I've heard Matt Chandler say that before. God has wired and fashioned you to be tired. You should sleep well at night because you've wrung yourself out at work, you've wrung yourself out for your kids, and then you are intentionally pursuing and wringing yourself out for your wife. You ever been to one of the vineyards not vineyards, I guess peach orchard is what I meant to say, up in Trenton. Let me tell you something. You don't grow the kind of peaches that Trenton grows by just planting a tree, leaving it, stepping back, putting it in autopilot mode, and just hoping you get some fruit. There's not a season in the life of a peach farmer where they're not cutting back, giving fertilizer, watering appropriately, getting rid of dead branches, and they're caring for the overall tree and vineyard in the same way. What it's saying here is that you're supposed to labor with your hands and you shall be blessed and it shall be well with you and your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. What that means is your wife will, will fulfill her God-given purpose to her greatest degree possible because you're stewarding and shepherding and intentionally going after her heart. And not only that, when she is, is doing everything that God has purposed for her, guess what, your children as well are gonna be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Men, we cannot put it in cruise control. The autopilot mode of your relationship is divorce. Let me say that again, the autopilot mode of your relationship is divorce. 
the Christian covenant commitment for life is as if we are standing with the gushing waters against us and we must stand firm and faithful in the midst of everything coming at us. One more thing, men, and then I am gonna speak to you too, ladies. Men, we need to put down our phones, turn off the TV, look at our spouse in the eyes, and talk and connect. And for some of you, you hear my voice and you're like, Stephen, that is difficult. Like I've worked with my hands for 10 hours. I've come home and I've been the best dad that I could possibly be for two hours. We finally wrangled these three kids, or in my case, these five children to bed. And then they came out of their room four times because they, they didn't, we weren't obedient staying in their rooms. And then finally I sit down on the couch and I'm able to prop up my feet and whew, take a breath and turn the TV on. Can I just tell you, when you put the kids to bed, you're only half done. That's when it begins, when we need to look at our wives in the eyes and go, how was your day? What is going? And as I'm saying that, I'm like, ooh, conviction in my own heart, like over and over and over. But I wanna speak that. I wanna speak life into our marriages. We must turn these things on and turn other things off in order that we can be intentional. Sarah and I, just this week, we're on a date night, and we try to do a date night once a week. It doesn't always work. But we were out Tuesday at Chili's, and uh, we had a great date, and then we were in the car, and I was thinking about this the whole time, and I was like, babe, can I ask you a question? And she got very nervous, like red-faced, like, oh, no, what's coming now? And, um, but I was like, I'm studying marriage, babe, and, um, and we've had 14 awesome years, right, in September, 14 awesome years, Not five kids, two miscarriages, ups and downs of life, changes in careers, changes in jobs and ministry, like, like all this stuff has been fun, awesome, lows, highs, like you name it, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, but I said, but I don't wanna just be like how it's always been. Like I probably got 35, 40 left with you and we've only done 14. So how can the next 35 or 40 be even better than the 14 behind us? Let me just tell you men, when you ask that question, get ready. Because <laughs> she began to say some things that were really convicting to me, some, some intentionality and some ways that I can serve her better, serve our kids better. And um, we put together kind of some, some things that we need to alter and we need to change in our marriages. And so, man, I would just challenge you, why not ask the question? It may not be what you wanna hear, but man, how cool that, that if she was truthful with you, you now know the plan and you know the intentionality and you know the, the work that you need to pull up your sleeves and get after in order that she could be fruitful in all that God has for her. Women, let me speak to you just briefly and I'm gonna speak to you more in the weeks to come. Women, do you remember the first time that your now husband was gonna come pick you up for a date? Do you remember how many outfits you tried on Shoot a, shoot, shot a selfie and then sent to your friends to see what they thought about it? Do you remember the butterflies in your stomach? Do you remember how you longed to get ready and, and then he was finally there and meeting the parents and picked you up and, and how you, you, you had that just sparkle in your eye as you looked at him, as you thanked him, as you spoke life to him? Let me tell you, in the same way, we have a tendency to stop doing the things that we did to get to the point of I do. And I think one of the most mis one of the ingredients that I see in the majority of marriages that find themselves in my office is words of affirmation and gratitude. Women, can I tell you how much your words matter to your man's heart? That you have the ability, it says this in Proverbs, that you have the ability of life and death in the power of your tongue. And you could speak criticism, even if he deserves it, or you have a choice to speak life and gratitude and hope. Let me tell you what, your words matter. And when we show honor through gr gratitude, there is powerful affirmation and gratitude, and it does something deep in the soil of us as men's hearts in order that, that we would know who we are, how you feel about us, and the God-given purpose that he's given us in our marriage and for our kids. So men and women, all of that to say, this takes work. You know what? Everything is sweet when we have to work for it. I tell my boys that all the time. Nothing glorious comes easy in life. Everything takes work and intentionality. All right, final thing, and I'll leave you with this today. I need to wrap this up. Number five, our marriages reflect a greater glory. Our marriages are built and purposed to display the glory of Jesus in his pursuit as the bridegroom to his bride, the church. And so if I marry you and you come down the aisle, this is the first thing I say in a marriage. I say, on behalf of, and I say the two names, 
Let me welcome you today in the sight of God in the presence of friends and loved ones to share in this very sacred and special moment in their lives. This ceremony is not only a time of celebration, but also a time of commitment, and I say as the husband, as the wife, commit themselves to one another and commit their marriage to God. And then I say this very important statement. It is God who created marriage. He designed it. And the primary purpose of marriage is to continually display the glory and the greatness of Jesus Christ and his perfect love and flawless devotion to his bride, the church. And so I go on and I say, so we gather today not merely to watch an event, but to worship the Lord and affirm our agreement and commitment to the home that is herein established. Why do I say that? I say that because our marriages reflect the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel is there's coming a day when Jesus is coming back for his bride, the church. This is written in the book of Revelation that I think hopefully we're gonna study soon as a church. And it says this in 19 verses seven through nine. Let us rejoice and exult and give glory, give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. You see, our marriages speak to the glory of the gospel. And the truth is that none of us operate in marriage as we should and as God has intended it. The reality is, is that we're all broken, messed up people. We lack intentionality. We operate from a place of selfishness and we have lack of intentionality and pursuit to our spouse. And if I had one encouragement for you today is that may we afresh come to the altar and surrender our heart and our life and our relationship to Christ. Because man, I want our marriages, not just to be good marriages, but to be godly marriages that display to the onlooking world the glory of the pursuit, forgiveness, grace, and mercy that Jesus has shown to his church. And we do that by loving, caring, submitting, and being intentional with one another. Let me remind you today and end with this. Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain vain that you rise early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved, what does it say? Sleep. What God desires for your house is peace and joy and rest. And that comes when we come to a place of absolute and utter desperation for his spirit's intervention in our hearts and in our marriages and with our kids. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, may this moment this morning be a moment of surrender a moment of commitment again, a moment of devotion, a moment of fresh confession, fresh repentance. God, show us as men and women where we fall short so often in our marriages. Help us not just be in the autopilot mode of just doing what we've always done in the monotony of life. Father, we wanna thrive We wanna be fruitful. We want our marriages to be joy-filled, satisfying, loving, caring, overflowing. But Father, we need you. So would you mold us and shape us? Would you search us and know us? See if there be any grievous way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Show us where we fall short in order that we can bring it to you and ultimately we can walk out of here free. Father, I know that I'm speaking to people right now that have unthinkable brokenness in their relationships. Father, would you give hope and vision for redemption and reconciliation? And Father, would they fix their eyes on you, a good Father working all things together for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.